This is Bill Farmer again. Welcome back to McMaster University course, Computer Science 1JC3, Introduction to Computational Thinking. Today we're going to finish up with the topic of information security. Uh, so in previous lectures, we talked about conventional encryption and public key encryption. And let's try to compare these two. So both of these kinds of encryption allow us to encrypt plain text and produce ciphertext, and then decrypt the ciphertext to produce plain text. So conventional encryption is much more efficient than public key encryption. Public key encryption is not really practical for large pieces of text. Now, public key encryption is much more versatile than conventional encryption because we can use it um, uh, for digital signatures and for secret key exchange. And also public key, public private key pairs are easily changed or revoked. Uh, so with uh, conventional keys, uh, once the key is created, that key can be used over and over again to encrypt anything, anything that was, I should say, decrypt anything that was encrypted with, with that key. Um, so let's go on to a question about internet shopping. It would be impossible to safely shop on the internet if public key encryption was no longer a viable mechanism. Is this statement true or false? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Well, welcome back. The answer is, is true as the internet has set up today. If we did not have public key encryption, when you went, wanted to go shopping, you're going to send your uh, credit card across the internet. Your credit card needs to be encrypted. You need to encrypt it using um, conventional encryption. Or, well, you need to use conventional encryption. So somehow you have to send the, the company you're shopping with, you have to send them a secret key. How can you do this? Well, you can't really do it without public key encryption. So yes, it is impossible to safely shop on the internet if public key encryption is no longer a viable mechanism. So I have another question. This is about quantum computing. So we don't really have time to go into what quantum computing is, but it's a kind of architecture, kind of hardware for doing computing, which has been Posed, there has not yet been a practical quantum computer. Um, but let's say there is a successful development of quantum computer. Would this have any effect on network security? So what I've said specifically, the successful development of a quantum computer will have no significant effect in network security. Is this statement true or false? Okay, take a moment to think about it. Well, welcome back. The answer is false. The reason for this is that if someone can build a practical quantum computer, one of the problems they can solve more efficiently is factoring large numbers. And if you can factor large numbers efficiently, then you can break the RSA algorithm. Remember, the RSA algorithm, its security depends on it being infeasible to factor a product of two large prime numbers. Okay, so I want to talk just a little bit about one of the applications that uses cryptography. This is called SSH. SSH is, stands for Secure Shell. So this is a service for logging into a, a, an account on another machine and using that account, transferring data and so forth. And there's a number of layers that 
are involved with this algorithm. There's that, the transport layer. The algorithm lets us do initial session key exchange. And it also allows us to authenticate the server, make sure we're actually connecting to the server we think we're connecting to. And then it allows us to do encryption, compression, and integrity verification. And it allows us to do session key re-exchange. So we can, we can, as needed, re-exchange the session key and use different session keys. So that's at the transport layer. It also can be used, I mean, this algorithm also supports user authentication. The user can authenticate themselves to the server. And this can be done with either a password or public key. And last, this, this application allows us to manage a whole series of communication channels. Channels between the SSH client and the SSH server. And these communication channels can be or may, they can either be or may not be encrypted. The reason they may not be encrypted is if they're not encrypted, then the transport, the transport uh, of information back and forth will be much faster and it may be there's no need to have some communication channels encrypted. So the last thing I'm going to do is go over what happens when you set up an SS connection. So let's say here's A, and A is an SSH client, and here's B, which is an SSH server. And we want to set up a connection between the two. This is how we do it. Uh, the first thing we do is a client and server establishes a TCP connection. So we're going to, so SSH is built on top of TCP. So that's number one. Number two is the client and server exchange protocol identification. So they make sure they're working with the same versions of SSH. Then the server sends its public host key to the client. And using that public host key, the client generates a session key. So this would be a session key for conventional encryption. It will encrypt it with the public host key. And then it sends it back to the server uh, with the actual cipher type they're using, whatever the conventional encryption is. So that's where key exchange is done. Uh, a uses uh, B's public key and then sends back an encrypted session key. And then B uses their private key to decrypt that session key. Now they have a session key. Now they can communicate back and forth in an encrypted way. So the next thing is the server, dec well, I should say, the server decrypts the session key with this private key. I've already mentioned that. The next thing is the client authenticates the server. So the client wants to make sure the server is really who the client thinks it is. It does this by taking the server's public host key and it checks to see if it's in the user's known host file. Um, if it is, everything's okay. If it's not, then the user is given an opportunity to add this key. And if it is, but the host key is changed, then the user is warned that the server may have been compromised. So what this says is the server is using a public host key that's different than what the server had been using before. And the next step is the client authenticates the user, so the client is operating on behalf of a user at A, the client authenticates the user to the server. Now this can be done just using a normal password mechanism, but it can also be done using public key authentication. Let's say like the RSA algorithm. So the server sends a challenge 
to the client that's encrypted with the user's public key. So the user's public key is stored on the server, and then the client decrypts the challenge with the user's private key. And this is decrypted using a passphrase that's supplied by the user when the private public key pair was generated. And then the client sends a required response, sign using the user's private key to the server, and then the server verifies the response by decrypting it with the user's public key. And then there's some few more things. The client makes several requests to finish up setting up the secure channel. And that's how, what it needs to be done to set up the SSH um, connection, which is a secure connection for communicating from one computer to another. Okay, so we're going to stop here, and this completes our topic for information security.